Hi there. Have you been a little bored listening to some of those podcasts lately? Listen, I hope you're not in the car right now with some kids. Because <laughs> I'm about to drop some F bombs. This ain't your average fucking podcast. Music. We like this cow. It's kind of one of those things. It's like a duck. You know, you see a duck in the water, right? The duck looks like it's cool, but the duck's freaking working hard under the water. Whoa, I'm working hard, working hard. That's how our place is. We look cool, but we're working hard. Welcome. You are now listening to the Duck Legs Podcast. We are physical therapy students here trying to bring you raw, honest, and ultimately funny material while we uh, interview the experts of our field. I was brought up listening to Smodcast, Kevin Smith, and Nerdist, man. I was brought up listening to comedy podcasts. So when we, when we were thinking about making a physical therapy podcast, I was like, we're going to make a comedy podcast that happens to talk about physical therapy. Exactly. Welcome to the Duck Legs. Well, fancy meeting you here, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Before we hit record, we were just learning about how entropy got its name yes and i love it i love the story we love the the name itself yes we don't love the twitter hater that's the, twi- the one twitter hater who, who disagrees with our definition of the laws of thermodynamics who probably yeah. doesn't know anything about physical therapy he just came across your your clinic one day and was like hey i think you know how you can you can like search words on social media i think he must have entropy tagged um, he is a, a devout entropist. It's everything he entropy this? related. <laughs> what does he do with his day? <laughs> I don't know. Big thing. But he knows. <laughs> but he knows more about. If he follows us on Twitter, he knows more about sex than he probably ever wanted to. So. <laughs> I bet he needs that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor guy. Maybe that's. See, maybe that's why he's been quiet lately. He, he went out. Uh, Doing a little functional training. Yeah. Lives. Good for him, right? <laughs> yeah. He's getting out there, learning some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> little functional training. Yeah. That's just like the nerdiest <laughs> physical therapy <laughs> joke of all time. <laughs> thank That's you. <laughs> such a big oh, buzzword. Thank you. That's like when you're in a group of people who aren't physical therapists, they're like, what the hell are these people? Why do they say functional so much? <laughs> they like just don't want to be around you and you're like giggly. <laughs> you're so clever okay um so to the listener we have miss sandy hilton on um this is a huge this is a huge one for us um so we've done this a few times if so i, I want to tell how i originally learned about miss sandy hilton jared already knew about her um and is it miss or doctor doctor yeah we need to figure that out Check. yeah Thanks. Or our, doctor, or master, supreme doctor, goddess, or just doctor Sandy, or Hilton. just <laughs> or just Sandy. That's cool. Um, and it was we were in class, and so she has a podcast, and it's called the Pain Science Podcast, and we've done this before. Pain Science and Sensibility. Right? Oh, oh, that's Come right. Pain Science and Sensibility, and we've done right. this before, where it's kind of that point where, hey, if you haven't listened to this podcast, stop what you're doing. And go actually, <laughs> go actually stop listening to this podcast and go listen to a better podcast. Yeah, <laughs> and so how uh, we, yeah, yeah, you know, we will wait because no, <laughs> so yeah, it's the uh, like Jeopardy music. <laughs> yes. Um, what is function? <laughs> so we were in class and with the, arguably one of my favorite, if not my oh, favorite yeah. professor That's of all best. time. And he was like, "Hey, you know, I listen to podcasts. We're like, oh, we got, oh, we we have a podcast, you know." And he's like, "Oh, what is it?" And we told him about it. And I was thinking, "Hey, I'm, you know, we're hot stuff, baby." <laughs> and he came back and he listened to it and he said, uh, "That that was cute." And he no. said, "If if, if you want to," he said, "If you want to listen to a real podcast <laughs> about physical therapy, you go listen to Pain Science and Sensibility." Oh, yeah. this is Corey. Is Corey your teacher? No, 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 no. <laughs> but I believe you know him. Uh, yeah, I'm not. T- I want to. I want to keep them on under okay, wraps. So okay. I don't want to put them out into the public okay. face right now. Um, well, we, but could, we could just edit it out. We no, it'd be fun. Yeah, we so, could uh, just edit no, it out. No. Okay, the, the, keep it mysterious. Keep it mysterious. Okay. So, but it, it was one of those professors where you're like, "Hey, this guy knows what he's talking yeah. about, right?" And uh, boy, was I excited to to hear it. You know, if, yeah. if you haven't heard the podcast yet, if you just want to get your entire world flipped upside down punched in the face and just say <laughs> like <"Ari- laughs> and you like, think my clinic name is weird man <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> Would you like to get punched in the face? Listen to this podcast. <laughs> it, yeah. And it's just, I, I got to come out off the get go. First question. Yeah. Are we going to research ourselves out of, out, out of a job? No. So I do feel like everything I hear on the podcast and Jared and I have been on a string of things. I'm going to shut up here soon. Jared and I have been on a string of, of interviews here lately where we've been talking a lot of individuals where um, various stuff I feel like you're kind of familiar with. That's like, Hey, it's not so much about the movement. It's about like, um, and I can't even kind of word it correctly, but kind of, um, Greg Lehman, if you will, or, or, and then a lot of, uh, I don't know how much you follow a clinical athlete, but it's like, it's about tolerance of movements and getting familiar with it and capacity over capacity. And then, yeah. and then making sure that it's just that over, over passive treatments. Yeah. Like, Cause we just talked to Derek miles and that was a big, but it was funny cause we had just had an interview with Derek miles and we also just took our myofascial course uh-huh. um, at our university. So even though like, I don't, we were, we were more on the side of, I think of, of, uh, I was kind of good about saying my professor, but on the pain science realm, on the build capacity over everything. Um, and so we weren't going into that course. We weren't like, Oh, everything is going to be solved with these hands and, and that kind of thing. But you know, I, I appreciated that course. I definitely appreciated the, the, the use of manual therapy and such to calm things down. And yeah. then we, we had the interview with Derek miles and, you know, he's got his stance and, and I totally agree with everything he's saying, but he's also on a side, on a, if I could put him to more of an extreme side of like to, to barely use it all because even, I don't want to misquote him, but even some usage of a passive modality such as manual therapy will, would lead to a, de- a dependence on that by the patient. And you're not, it's almost like why even do it if they're going to get hooked on a passive modality, you know? Uh, well, so oddly enough, to plug, to plug the podcast, um, uh, you might have heard of Adam Meekins. Um, oh, yeah. He, Adam, uh, I, I invited him, one of those invitations that thou shalt not ignore. Um, mm. He, Adam came on the pain science and sensibility podcast we just recorded it on saturday nice. so it'll go up whenever eric you know gets some time out of his pool and puts the drink down and loads it <laughs> um which hopefully will before this releases or else it's gonna <laughs> oh, we'll call him um, eric. um no but anyway so we had eric uh or adam on there and, and we were we were discussing uh what the role is in manual therapy and and what you know what there really isn't much evidence out there for anything we do in physical therapy. There's level one evidence for working with incontinence. Um, and the rest of it's pretty weak to moderate uh, that we can do things, but no, I don't think that'll put us out of a job. What I think it will do is make us much more efficient um, to know when to de-adopt the things that really are a waste of time. Um, and, and that's a little bit to Derek's point of doing things that are, are gonna help people the most but I was on there defending manual therapy to, uh, to Adam and also defining it a little um, because the when we start talking about it we should probably uh, define what we mean when we're saying the words because a- Adam's definition and my definition are different yes. um, and he's like finally comes to this point not to ruin our podcast he comes to this point and he's saying well okay but but you can't do it when you're lying down and I'm like yeah and I had this whole um, picture in my head of trying to do pelvic internal sensory integration techniques standing. I'm like, please no. <laughs> I'm, wow. not gonna, I, I'm not. I'm not. So uh, that's was talking, giving you an example of non, I'm not doing that in the gym while someone's trying to walk. Um, yeah. I think, I think I said something very elegant, like I'll break my wrist. Um, <laughs> and and it, I mean, it's just there's a place for helping people figure out how to move their body without hurting. Uh, and I I think that. I've argued that fairly well uh, to to people. How many names can I drop in one small podcast? Um, I've I've argued that fairly well to some of the researchers I really highly respect, um, and it's okay. It's biologically plausible, and you try not to make too terribly high claims about what you're doing or what mechanism it's working by because I don't think anyone really knows um, yeah. but if I can put my hands on you and you feel better and not scared and then I can get you up and moving and you can do that for yourself I really think that has some value and yeah. um, and I think a, a, a good PT is going to do that in a way that that gets people knowing that the magic's in that person not in my hands I have fantastic hands but the magic really is in them 
Um, and that, that's huge because then, then they don't need us. So, <laughs> so it's a really crappy business policy. But if I can make people not need me, then they go off and they're doing things and they tell all their friends, yeah, I, I used to have to, you know, not be able to go hiking, but now I'm fine because I saw this person and then those people come. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So there's, there's a point that I don't want to, because I love, I love what uh, Dr. Sandy just said, but there's a point that, and it, it's because everything on social media kind of gets uh, oh, skewed. Hyperbole or whatever. Yeah, I feel hyperbole. Like it's all yeah. like, it feels like people are on two different sides because when you're reading some, some people that, that, are, uh, that are very strongly against manual therapy, you know, for, and for all the right reasons, it almost sounds like anything you do just to make a patient feel good with your hands or with maybe like a, like the Theragun things that are out there. And we can talk about Theragun and all that stuff later, but anything that, that you Set. do. <laughs> Distance dry needling. We just load yeah. it up and go. <laughs> no, yo, it's, I don't know if you see it. It's actually like a, a just a massage weapon. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. That it's like, yeah, I was going to say vibrator, but not really a vibrator. It's like a, a drill. Thing. Yeah. A drill. Like, yeah. Like a, or like a sander. Exactly. A sander, but it has a massage head on it instead of, yeah. <laughs> um, but it almost it, it almost kind of makes you feel guilty for making up somebody feel better would be a passive modality. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, have, have either of you guys ever went and gotten a massage just because you felt like it? Yes. Mm. It feels good. There is absolutely nothing wrong with feeling good. And and gosh, we can get totally geeky. The doing things that feel good run the the really good parts like dopamine and serotonin. Um, they're protective. They're anti-inflammatory. They help our immune system. That's all cool. Um, that sounds pretty evidence-based to me. I got, yeah. <laughs> sounds. Very Science very words. Nice. Science words. <laughs> Keep them. So can we, are, are we putting you on record to say that <laughs> – touching people for the you know purposes of getting them kind of uh, for lack of a better term <laughs> of patient buy-in you know like getting them getting them into it isn't the end of the world i think words are really hard yeah, um, <laughs> words are hard <laughs> but e Yes. And doesn't a good coach do that when they're, if we're, we take this into the professional athlete realm, if someone can't quite figure something out that you do a little um, manual assist to, to learn a motor plan or, mm -hmm. or, um, or we use our words to encourage um, or uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But I think that, that the underpinning mechanism that you, you attribute to that, is really critically important. So, and those words are huge because they're either going to steal self-efficacy or they'll build them. Um, you know, telling people uh, your, your sacrum's unstable and I can do this manual therapy technique to put it back in proper alignment. Eh, we've got lots of evidence to say that for many reasons is not a good idea and isn't um, cool. Paul Hodges, um, Sunday at the World Congress on Abdominal and Pelvic Pain, stood up in front of a room and said, stop it. Um, you know, don't stop saying people that instability is an iatrogenic harm. Stop using it because it, it's not understanding that the, uh, the concept of how, how something is stable would, means it can vary and adapt to the forces put on it. So stable within its physiological realm, not stable like a static point. Um, and, and he's like, your people are just getting the words wrong and you're actually harming people with them. Um, so if, if, if Paul Hodges is out there saying, stop it, then I think people should probably listen. Um, he certainly has enough research to back himself up. And um, so that, you know, the, those, those things are important. Um, do we need, so you had asked in the beginning, is, is, are we going to evidence ourselves out of a, a career? Um, I think what, what we might evidence ourselves out of is um, education companies that teach level 47 or something. Because <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Come on, I'm on level 46, man. <laughs> Stop now. See, I just saved you $650 plus airfare plus hotel room. I need right. two more levels, though. Two more levels. <laughs> I feel like I'm like a Scientologist. <laughs> I mean, hey, I gotta stop. <laughs> right, but but so so how if we're non-specific, that means good news. You just need to learn some ideas and then go play. Yeah. Um, so this is, and I don't mean to put you in too much of a tough spot here, but what a what is what is 
you know, although what I keep thinking about is where's the shift of PT going and it's all this like, we're the movement professionals, right? We're movement experts. And is, is that the case? And, and it, it almost, maybe because I just, cause I, I just mainly listen to you through your podcast, but it's like, are we more of pain experts? Is it like, where, where are we? I don't, I don't, I don't think we have to get too narrow in that. Um, if you're helping someone move, then they're going to be less likely to do that if they hurt. So we should know a lot about um, pain and how it might limit movement and ideas to help them uh, overcome that. Um, so it's a component of what we do. Uh, but I, I work with people that don't hurt too. So, you know, we, we, we can be that. Um, I, I think defining a profession by a technique is a, is a mistake and defining a profession by a body part is a mistake and unless you're a dentist. Um, but for us, if we're going to say we're, we're movement specialists, then we get to, to claim the entire body and how it inner, inner, you know, yeah, I can't think of that word, how it gets along in its world. Um, and, and that gives us a whole lot of different options. Uh, that spans the whole thing because sometimes these talks get put into outpatient orthopedics and we've got people working with kids in the zero to three program, helping them move. Mm -hmm. um, we have people in nursing homes and all around with different ages all across the spectrum. Um, and, and we can do that, keep them moving well and functioning and, and hopefully that gets them healthier longer and with less cost to a system, but I think more importantly, more fun in their life. Um, mm -hmm. Understanding pain's part of that, but that's not all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I always get a little narrow-minded, too, because I'm not so much mm -hmm. focusing on peds, and I forget some, you know, peds are other areas. I forget the importance of, of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it does feel like, especially when you're on social media, that all of PT is just in the ortho world, and it's just, it's just shit-talking between ortho PTs and, yeah. you know, he's on at least the groups that I'm in, yeah. but that's my fault. <laughs> Well, yeah, but but if that's what you're interested in, and hang out in those groups, um, uh, yeah, that's no problem with that. But it is a really huge profession, and and I think that's part of why trying to define it is is problematic. Yeah. Um, yeah. What would you say to somebody at a party that when they ask, "What do you do? What's a what does a physical therapist do?" <laughs> oh, those are two different questions. Oh, um, sorry. If, <laughs> If I'm at a party and someone asks what I do, I say that I work, uh, I, I'm a physical therapist and I help people that hurt or are having problems doing what they want to do, uh, get over that and, and get back to the things that they love. Um, that's my elevator speech. Um, if someone asks me what a physical therapist is, that's hard for me. And I've been doing this for 29 years. Um, it, it's essentially a part of that is, is that it is a profession of people that work with all different ages and in all different settings to help people uh, get out of pain or get back to doing the things that they love or maybe both. Um, I try and keep it general for all my PT colleagues. Um, if they really want to know what I do, I tell them I do all the stuff that no one likes to talk about at dinner about peeing and pooping and sex. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> go, poop go, and go. sex. <laughs> poop, pee, sex. So, poop, pee, sex. I, wanna, I want to dive super deep on the poop, poop, poop pee, and <laughs> sex. Because okay. I, I got a lot to learn when it comes to pelvic health. Mm -hmm. But I do want to get this, this question we out need to before. Take a certain course. I know, right? Hey, I, I know. know. No, I know this class is coming up in March. March, um, hey. March, two to four in Chicago at Entropy. Can I geek out for just a second? And Do yeah, it. it's a, it's a total, it. it's a total ad. So I already said Paul Hodges is like ah, Paul, one of the leading researchers uh, in musculoskeletal world, and not I mean the whole world, but also certainly in physical therapy. Uh, he's coming to Chicago to teach a men's health course with Sarah and I. Mm-hmm. Two and a half days, real-time ultrasound, male pelvic models. We're, we're going to dive deep into the science. Um, and that was hard. That was like, I've, never, I've not done a PhD, and I have huge, huge um, just respect for the people who have gone through that process, process and how hard it is to ask a good answerable question. And, yeesh. But, but to lay out your theories of 
of why you do what you do in front of one of the leading researchers, like he's just looking through with a little red pen to mark it up, was wow. absolutely terrifying. Um, <laughs> and it turned out well. No, Paul's a lovely, a lovely guy, and he's very polite, but it was really just like, whoa, talk about vulnerability. <sighs> but it went well. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. So, yay. So, yeah, we're doing a class with him, which is so cool. And it is all on, on pee and pooping and sex, which is what yeah. I thought about that. Let's, <laughs> let's go deep. Let's go into it now. Um, all right. What, like, pelvic health, like, what is going on there? Do the muscles, I honestly don't know, and, and, and I have to apologize to the listener. I know I'm already sounding like an elementary <laughs> student, you know. Not but that's, your fault. They so, don't teach it in school, in the classes, the books, they, if you look in um, some of the best orthopedic books, they do hip and pelvis, right? But it's like inside hollow pelvis. Yeah. And they, they leave out all the muscles, like the poor obturator internus and the Gamelli brothers and, and some really important things, um, like your pelvic floor, the levator group, and the superficial pelvic. Yeah. There's Gamelli. a lot. The Gamelli brothers. <laughs> they get no love. <laughs> they get no love, and they're fantastic. They're important because they're there. Um, they're, so, so mostly it's, it's left out, and I think that's cultural, social. It's okay. Um, people are embarrassed. Um, but they're, they're exquisitely important if you want to do something like put your foot on the ground where you think it should be uh, and not leak stool or urine when you do that. And uh, <laughs> this is so much fun because I cannot see you guys, so I, I can't really read my audience well. So I'm just gonna, and if you've ever had an orgasm, you yes. will notice that that's a, a pleasant experience. Yes. Um, the pelvic floor muscles are, are a lot of that. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. So they're, they're kind of important to life and sustaining life. Uh, but we leave them out of PT school, so it's not your fault you don't know about them. Most people are like, eh, I can, yay, I can say the original Lost Westry has a sex question on it. It was revalidated in 2001 by some Americans who didn't like the question. It's American. As Westry. I just fall asleep when I hear it. Oh, well, it used to be exciting when they had the sex question. Yeah. They took it off. It would have been a very exciting questionnaire. <laughs> It'd be a <laughs> totally nice. different ball game. This is going to be a hot questionnaire I'm about to give you. So, right? The, but they took it off because they was like, oh, that's embarrassing. People leave it blank. But it's, a, it's hugely important because it's part of one of the red flags for Cotto Aquinas syndrome. But also, if you have back pain, which is, that's how I got into pelvic health, was working with guys with mechanical low back pain that couldn't have sex because it hurt. Mm. Um, so... So I was very popular with the logging camp in Oregon, but yes. um, the um, it, it's an it's an important part. So your your pelvic floor muscles have to relax for you to be able to pee or poop. Uh, they need to do some really well timed contractions um, are helpful with orgasms, and luckily you don't have to consciously do any of that because you'd be a bit distracted. Thank God. Um, <laughs> Hang on, the, time to contract. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I missed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, <Nice. laughs> the, <laughs> timing is everything. Yes. The, um, so there's, and besides, public health therapy is so many better jokes. And, and oh our, God, yeah. our compliance, and so now I have to put a little asterisk after that and tell the people who do not have my sense of humor, no, I don't make those jokes for people who don't like them. I'm very respectful and I understand you. But for the people who do like my sense of humor, we have some really, really fun conversations. Um, the... The world of physical therapy, like I said, that's our best evidence. It's on, on incontinence. Um, and it, uh, one of the reasons that young girls stop exercising uh, and doing high school sports is because they're leaking and they're yeah. embarrassed. Um, it's so sad when it's something that really we've got like an 86% success rate. Who has that? That's in pretty good. In, tw in 12 visits to eliminate those symptoms. Wow. Um, so to not send people for help and to not know that help is available is just sad. Uh, you don't have to be the one that does it. No one, not everyone likes to put their fingers in people's mouths to work on TMJ stuff. They certainly may not want to put their finger in a vagina or a rectum. Um, the, and you shouldn't if you're not comfortable with it, but you should refer to someone who's okay with that. And I can tell we don't hang out there. There's, you're just assessing and teaching and moving on. But um, We don't spend 45 minutes. 
I, I, yeah, I do not. That's a very, <laughs> could you imagine like 45 minutes just like working on the, the base of someone's thumb? That's a lot of time on a small bit of area. There's so many other things you can do. Um, so no, don't hang out there very long. Um, it gives me a little confidence if I ever <laughs> have to go to pelvic health because I have no idea. I could be, I mean, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's about to happen to me in there. Aw. <laughs> yeah, I could look we at have, you. We would, we would, <laughs> aww, okay. we would, um, we would teach you. Okay. The, the, the we're gentle. No, it's like any anything and anything you do in therapy. It's uh, here's what I'm going to do. We've models, so you can show people in pictures. And this is what I'm going to do. And it should take about five minutes to do the eval. And um, it's, it's supposed to not hurt. Um, so tell me if it does, because I can't feel what you feel. Is yeah. pretty standard lines. Um, and if if something's painful, I'll modify. If you need me to stop, I will. Um, so. And, so Jared and I both teach some group fitness stuff and things like that. And it wasn't, um, I, boy, I'd been, I, I'd been training for like a year and a half, two years. And I, and I learned that all of a sudden, you know, women and girls or whatever, a lot of them weren't doing things like jump squats because they, or yeah. they're like, I don't like to run cause they, they leak or, or right. w- whatever. And I had, you know, I, I started going, you know, women go to the bathroom a whole lot. When, when would you say that is just the anatomy versus a dis? I don't want to say dysfunction, but well, something's going on there. D- dysfunction will work with that because it's um, well. So in normal blood, oh, wait, can, I'll test you guys. How Uh-oh. long? How long? Ready? Get your pencils. Um, okay. How? I can't see. You can open the test. Um, what open is the book test. what is the normal length of time for a human bladder, an adult human bladder, to fill? Whew. Are we doing the Jeopardy music right now? Dude. <laughs> oh, damn. Fully fill. Boy. Okay. Are we talking full of tequila? Boom, or boom. Boom. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Ooh, that's a really good question. Good job. Okay. Um, so two to four hours and, and alcohol or caffeine or sugar or acid will will because the chemical composition is an irritant to the bladder can make you pee sooner than that because it's a very clever system that will say, Ooh, gross, get it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll get an urge to, to empty your bladder before it's actually full. If the contents is, is irritating. Um, so if someone is going, if you're noticing them working out and it's been less than two hours since the last time they peed and they haven't been drinking tons of water, um, and they only go in and then come right back out, they are most likely doing what we call just in case emptying and they're worried they're going to leak. So that'd be something my kids, my kids were little, they made me promise that I would never ever in public knock on some stall in a bathroom and say, Hey lady, I don't think you really need to pee. That was just like three or four seconds. You should wait longer. <laughs> yeah. Be the pee police. Right. So mom, tell me you don't do that. No. I really, I don't. Um, I do think it though. You know, you're in the bathroom with someone, and they're like tinkle, 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 and then they're done, and you're like, man, that's really bad. Letter. You should have waited <laughs> two more hours. Or here's my card. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> the, but but it's it's really that changes your life if you have to pee that often. Um, oh god. If you yeah, have to yeah, if you man. know where all the bathrooms are. I mean, that's a really cool screening tool. When you go out in the community, do you, do you know where all the bathrooms are? Or do you wait till you get home? And wow. they'll look at you like, whoa, clever person, why are you asking me this? You're weird. But it will, <laughs> it will put it in their head that that's not normal. Because um, so, yeah, so the pelvic floor muscles and the internal sphincter, the detrusor muscle of the bladder itself should be able to maintain the closure of the bladder through the pressures uh, and meet the pressure of the inner abdominal cavity and bouncing up and down while they do it so that nothing comes out unless you want it out. So, pelvic health rehab for those of us who haven't seen it, idiots, right? No, I have, I have no. Is blissfully it, ignorant. That's yeah, blissfully. Yeah, bliss, um, is it like I, I, I feel like the the like kind of YouTube ortho kid inside me is like thinking <laughs> that they're doing breathing diet, like a lot of diaphragmatic breathing, like pelvic health. You got the two diaphragm and the pelvic bowl. They run together. Is it? Yeah. Is it a lot of that? Is it? What does it look like? Well, 
Well, I, I said it's hilarious. So on our, our uh, yeah, like all these videos are the rage on everyone's page, right? They're doing all these, here's my exercise for this. And here's my exercise for that. And people like Chris Johnson do gorgeous ones with running. This is not to mock. It was just more a little mocking and yeah. it's mildly mocking of uh, really. And people are like, oh, you should do that for public health. I'm like, what exactly would that look like? So I made one uh, a couple students back. <laughs> We made one, and and one of the guys over in Scandinavia made the male version, and it's um it's just me standing, and then me sitting on a therapy ball, and then me with a foot up on a plyo box. It's like, hey, look, advanced, intermediate, and beginning pelvic floor exercises, because uh, you can't really see. It's just a matter of uh-huh. of selective control and relaxation, and uh, we do. So if someone were to come in for an eval, like we'll say incontinence, and we're trying to find out, uh, you know, how are you, we do a bladder diary, find out what's really going on with when they drink and when they pee and what kind of urge there was and if they leak or not, because that data is really helpful. Um, But then, you know, we do an assessment and find out, do your pelvic floor muscles contract when they're supposed to, when you ask them to, and relax fully when you ask them to? Um, Can they extend a little, just like that, that plus you get when you lift your arm over your head and you can go just that little bit more. Um, your pelvic floor muscles can do that on descent and contraction. So you, you check all that out and the timing and relative strength or at least recruitment. Um, and then if they can do that well, then you get them up and you do that in sitting or in standing or um, in like squats and lunges and things like that where you're you're able to contract and relax the pelvic floor and in dynamic activity, sort of, because normal humans just go run. They're not thinking on stance, I'm going to contract my left pupil coccygeus at 40%. Um, uh. That would really mess you up. So what you need is just a, a good timing, good coordination, and then some practice and different demands. Um, strength and conditioning is a thing for the pelvic floor, but the conversations are hilarious. Um, and yeah, it just looks like normal exercise. Once you find out that the timing's right and the, the bladder's doing the right thing and their toileting habits are good and they're not emptying too soon, because there's a really cool thing about bladders is that um, they get better at being full and, and tolerating that stretch and heaviness of a full bladder by doing it. So if you empty too often too soon then the bladder does it starts you start to get a sense of you can't fill anymore before you're even close to full and then the system gets dysfunctional um and you're you're getting a my bladder's full signal way before it is because we adapt to everything right yeah we do so then and then you put some load on it so you calm it down you build it back up and you load it load load is everywhere yeah oh my god even in pelvic floor, it's all about the load. Right? It's all about the load, shearing, all those kind of things. What when you say contract the pelvic floor, are we talking Kegels? Or we yeah. Talking- uh, well, so so for for boys, there's some evidence on this. Um, uh, of the, the Australians, of course, did a beautiful study. Um, one of the effective cues that's been shown on on EMG and real time ultrasound to to actually target the muscles you're aiming for is is to um, uh, shorten the penis. Ah. No hands. It's just, this is not manual therapy. It's just, you know, imagine that you're shortening the penis. Um, I hear that works well, and the study says it does. I, I don't have those parts, so I can't tell you. Um, it's probably a hard cue to give to a guy. <laughs> well, it's ironic. They didn't, they didn't actually think that that would work because like, that's not intuitively something that most guys would be like, hey, I wish I had a... Um, <laughs> the, but but it, it's apparently... A, a really good neural cue. Um, they one of the other Aussies call um, does nuts to the guts or testicles to your spe- spectacles, but the argument against that is that that sounds like it's a really high effort contraction, and what what you're trying to do is just selective control and coordination. Um, the for the for the back passage, as the Brits and the Aussies call it, is a nice cue. Is just I t- I'm I'm so not classy. If you haven't figured that out yet, the um, <laughs> so the, the question it's like so pretend you're in a really important meeting and you don't want to fart what will oh, you do yeah i know that cue so well right and then pretend you're with your friends and you're trying to see who farts the loudest i know Those that are, cue so well. <laughs> right Thank you, hanging out with army rangers. Um, yes. the, so, so those are two different felt senses in your body, <laughs> or perhaps smelled senses, and um, and it senses. it's um, 
that's that's a cue you can use, but that's for the back part. So if it's someone that's trying not to pee, you're trying to, to recruit the whole thing. Is you, you need to get the whole the whole pubic coccygeus that goes from the pubic bone to the coccyx. I love muscle names. They're just Latin yes. for where they live or what they do. So easy. Um, <laughs> just fix yourself. <laughs> right. But it's so funny. It's like we panic about learning them, and then you realize that the levator scapula means lifts the, <laughs> the scapula. scapula. Yeah. Like, can you imagine calling it that? Hey, it lifts the scapula. Good job. <laughs> the, um, Genius. <laughs> it sounds it sounds so much better in Latin. Um, but so yeah, so you want to get that whole muscle going and just get cues to do it. Um, once you learn that, once you have it, it's as good as when you know you can touch your thumb to your pinky, whether your hand's in front of you and you can see it, or behind your back and you can't. And you get that proprioceptive awareness yes. and timing and and you error control. Um, so we're essentially we're training that, and then we take that into real life activities uh, like jumping and running and rock climbing and whatever. Do you use, cause when the first time I heard about Pivo Cox and Gius and, and Kegels, the cue was always pretend like, or go pee and then try to stop peeing. Yeah. Well, there was a thought that's, that's kind of changing. It's a really good question. Cause, cause when I was taught in public health courses, they said, don't to do that. Don't do that because it's while you can test like that um, to see whether you can generate force closure, it's um, probably not great neurologically to train that confusion of bladder saying, go empty, wait, just kidding, go <laughs> empty, no, nope, just yeah. kidding. It's, it's probably confusing, but some of the, um, again, an, an Australian group says that yeah, it's not likely to mess you up and it can be a good functional um, test. So I don't know. I tend not to because that's how I was trained, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if it would really mess someone up or not. Richard Pryor has a bit about that too, about <laughs> shutting Does off he? your pee. You well, it, the, right, and, and then the, the movie Airplane makes for a great um, ah. way to, to get people to understand what good bladder emptying should sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Continuous, strong strain. Yeah, you know, a good, strong strain, like the guy in Airplane, but maybe not that long. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, that's a good... That's a good cue. How long should we be streaming, Sandy? Uh, eight seconds ish mm. of a what? good strong stream that indicates a, a cup or two of urine, depending on your bladder capacity. Nice. Very. I'm learning so much that like she's throwing out so many funny things that like I get, I hear that, but I'm too busy focusing <laughs> in <laughs> that like I'm like that was funny. <laughs> but but I'm that, too but just wait, next time you go pee, you're going to be counting because that's what oh, you do. Oh, you better yeah. believe I'm going to count it. Yes. All the listeners are going to be counting, right? They're going to be counting. You stop the podcast. Go, just, go count. Okay. Right now. Do, 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 do. No, wait. Eight seconds. <laughs> what, what do you do? <laughs> um, <laughs> and poop and sex. Can you, can you do a pelvic health? just external external public health or do you almost or, or are you kind of in the thought of saying hey you pretty much always need to go internal at some point you'll find out different things depending on on what happens and uh, shout out to sarah haig my business partner um she does an absolutely gorgeous job of explaining this to the guys that are coming in before they have prostatectomies scared uh, just got told they have cancer. They're going to get a part of their body removed. They're looking at possibly being impotent and incontinent. Um, oh God. And, and it is big and they're, they're, they're nervous. And she's just fantastic. At, at, at the, by the time they leave an hour later, they're like, see you later if I need you. And they're, it's good. But she, she does a gorgeous job of like this three step thing of, of if someone, if someone will, will it, it um, allow an internal exam, we can find out a lot. We can find out what those muscles are, are doing, how well they contract because we're right on them and check the timing and the coordination and get an idea of strength and, um, and that's ideal. Um, if someone's uncomfortable with that, doesn't want that to happen, then there are some things we can do with an external, literally naked, uh, covered up in the front because we typically don't need to see that when we're looking at pelvic floor function. Um, the, so we preserve modesty for men and women as we do this. Um, and the, you, can, you can have do those same cues I talked to you about, and there should be a visual lift. Guys have the easiest biofeedback. Just stand naked in front of a mirror. Glad I can't see what's going on over there. Um, and we're, we're doing, this. Um, doing it, doing it as we talk. Uh, if you stand naked in front of a mirror and you try, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to practice that cue. Let me see if I can shorten my penis. Let me see if I can lift the testicles. You would see things move. 
because the muscles move, so you'll see the bits move. Um, if you contract the back, you'll see a drawing up and in around the uh, rectum um, or a bulging of the pelvic floor, and you can get an idea. You can palpate at the perineal body and see what's going on. Um, if, if they won't let you do that, then what I will do is have them sit and do their own, put their own hand under their bums at the, find the sit bones and the area between your sit bones, that's your pelvic floor. Um, so you get your own biofeedback and then you can do some contracting and relaxing and see if you can feel those, those muscles move. Um, so there's a lot I can teach depending on what I got to do. Um, but internal is going to get me the most uh, information. So we were laughing. I was about to reach for my yes. floor, and then I forgot Tyler was right sitting next to me <laughs> again. We, you're like so into it yeah. that you're like I zoned oh. out. It's like I got to do this. Yeah, this is a lot of like I'm just off. Like I'm not even here right now next to you. Like you're yeah. saying, like I'm sitting there thinking about being in front of a mirror, um, waving at yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and, and to be clear, the the pelvic floor that that when we say pelvic floor, we're talking about the space between. Um, all right. so, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> so, no, that's, that's perfect. So you, you get the, the sit bones, the ischial tuberosities, okay. the bones upon which you sit. Um, and they're like the little feet of the pelvis. Oh. Um, and you can roll backwards towards the back end of them, and that's more towards your tailbone, which is the back side of the, the pelvic floor muscles, um, tailbone and, and sacrum. Um, and then up back again forward towards the pubic bone in the front and that that forms the boundaries of your pelvic floor muscles so if you're sitting and you do a pelvic floor contraction you should feel that space lift a little further away from the surface maybe just a change in tension and then if you stop lifting it would settle back down and you can even like push down a little that's the bearing down or trying to fart or whatever classy cue you want to use. Um, and that would put more pressure onto it. It's so subtle though. It's not like, not like lifting your arm overhead. It's just a shift in pressures. Do you suggest, how's the breathing pattern? With in and out. So inhale, it goes up, exhale, it goes <laughs> oh, just, down. Just breathe. <laughs> okay. Um, you can do it. So really if it goes, if you're talking about physiological function at rest, because that's different. It was very Greg Lehman-y. Um, at rest is different than when you're running. Please do not be wondering about your timing of your pelvic floor contraction while you're running. Just run and breathe. Um, but so at rest, uh, as you do a good relaxed diaphragmatic breath, the ribs expand, the diaphragm descends, the interabdominal pressure increases, but it is mitigated by the pelvic floor descending just a little. Mm. Um, and then as you exhale, that returns to its resting spot and the air goes out. So there's a little piston um, to that. Julie cool. Weave does a beautiful talk on that. Um, yeah. Uh, I told uh, the people I was coaching today that I was going to interview somebody. I didn't say your name because they don't know. Not that, you, <laughs> that they should. That's okay. No, but that's I, fine. I, I described kind of who you are. And I just want to throw this in here right quick for the listeners. Haven't you done some literature, like wrote like some sort of clinical practice guidelines or something like that on it? Uh, uh, working on pelvic pain. I'm working yeah. on clinical practice guideline. Meryl Alapadu, Mark Bishop and I are, are embarking on a clinical practice guideline for, for pelvic pain. Um, we're so at the review the literature stage and it's like 427,000 articles or maybe 12,000, but it's, it's a lot. Um, Whoa. <laughs> so much. 12,000. No, but so, so this is the first time I've ever done such a thing. Um, and, and it's a, so we're doing a lit review to see what's out there. Um, and then we'll grade the evidence on it. Uh, we have a team of international folks waiting to help us. Um, when we get to that stage, um, yeah, we'll have a clinical practice guideline for pelvic pain. Can can we get a, a dummy's guide to how clinical practice guidelines form? Yeah, I got I got step one. Okay, but you're getting the dummies. You're getting the dummies guide to this because I, as I said earlier, I'm not a PhD. Um, I, I, I <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with my research friends, but I'll say it anyway. I figure I'm like more the color commentary in the football. <laughs> yes, that's great. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> clinical practice. Um, but so there is an art to this. There are rules to this. And there are clinical practice guideline rules for formation. The APTA does a beautiful job of helping groups through this. So it's being done 
to the standards that would get it accepted into the clinical practice guideline clearinghouse. Um, the, so we're following those rules. Um, we, you, you get a, a small team that starts. Um, Meryl Alipato is our lead. Mark is helping her, and I am the clinician. Um, and then we have an interdisciplinary group because you want all the stakeholders. So we have doctors, and we're going to have uh, at least one or two patients um, on there, and people from different systems. So we've got uh, some Australians, some Canadians, uh, a couple other um, people that are waiting to help us with the, the reviewing of the articles so that this isn't just a, a U.S.-centric or one inst institution-centric view, but what does the literature best inform us? Um, and then at some point you've gotten, so you've done all the lit, you've done the lit review, you do the, the winnowing down of duplicates and, and then the articles you need to review to decide whether they, they fit in or not. When you get down to the ones that, that fit and you have your justification for us, there's three of us doing it. So every article has to be agreed on by two of the team. And then one person is the person who handles the disputes if you don't agree. Um, and then that final clump of articles goes to the, the larger team that is going to um, do the reviewing and scoring. And then we'll write it, and then it will go out for public commentary, and then it will come back for revisions, and then we'll see if it, we can get it published. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hefty, hefty process there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, and it really needs needs to be done by by researchers like clinicians are very enthusiastic but i don't have their this Marilyn and mark are down in gainesville so they they have the uh, uh real librarians which are god's gift to research um and and understand how they can help and find things they have access to all the articles that we need i don't um so yay this would not happen without them so I think, I think clinicians need to be involved in the process, but you have to be paired up with a, a researcher and, and an organization or institution that has the, the, the people that can help you make this happen. Mm -hmm. to, me, to me, research, when Jared and I were talking about this earlier, and I don't know, it, it's mainly, it's, it's my fault, it's because I'm lazy, <laughs> but to me, research is, is really difficult because I feel like I can go find a positive, what, like, uh, oh, goodness, what's the word? Uh, you're going to have to help me. I'm like, I can go find what I'm looking for. I can go find three research articles. We just had an assignment on trigger, trigger point. Points, yeah, yeah like, you had to argue for and against. And how easy was it for you just to find? So easy. Just go find three that are look good and three that go against it. Yeah, and, and that's really confusing, isn't it? Um, you, there are, there are ways to know whether a research study, uh, is, is robust. Um, why, you know, you, all those things like how, how well powered is it? There are answers to that. My favorite way, and thanks to Neil O'Connell for, for helping make this less frustrating is the CASP tools. They're free. They're out of the UK and it walks you through a systematic review or, um, uh, randomized controlled trials of how to read them and score them to know whether or not you should even keep reading. Like, does it ask an answerable question or do they, do they state their question? Um, Cause some papers don't, they just start talking. Um, it, do they, do they account for the people that dropped out? There's all ways that you cheat and make your data look good. Mm -hmm. Well-meaning people being naughty is the, that's what Neil says. That's naughty. I'm like, okay, I like that. Um, Cause these aren't, you know, people put a lot of time and effort into it. You want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But, but sometimes they, they make claims that aren't substantiated by the data, and that's not fair. And that, that's hard, too. That's, a hard, uh, that's hard for a, a consumer to think about, somebody that's not, that yeah. does not quite appraise <laughs> research at a higher level like, yeah. like you do, Sandy, to, to look at an article and then think about the people behind it and say, look, they put in a lot of time and, you know, <laughs> and they're wrong. <laughs> and they're wrong. And their bias was coming out. And they right. Well, the see, data. so much. Of, but so much. Of one of the best ways to you can tell is you read things and they say, "So we embarked on this study to prove that our technique works." And eh, done. Oh, because you're just done right there. Because huh? you're done. Like I'm going to do a study to show that dry needling works. No, you're not. Because yeah. no. Um, but if you come up with a question that is answerable and as unbiased, we're all biased. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're all biased, but, but there's, there's that. And then there's the, oh yeah, I just designed this thing to prove my point. That's not actually research. That's just a really expensive opinion. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I've got a, a very hefty opinion. <laughs> very, very expensive opinion. And it's a shame though, because, because it's, that's not that's not a dig on the people that are doing it. It's really not. It's mostly just a shame, and and more on the reviewers who accepted it, um, and the the IRB that approved it. And come on, don't just don't. So, um, how much? And this is a joke. How much corruption is there in the the review? How much fake news? How much fake news? Is it like? Is it like? Yo, listen, <laughs> it's everywhere. You got to be on your guard. Are you like? Look, it's there. I don't know. Be on your guard because we're all biased, and yeah. I, I don't think it's done on the some some person with a long handlebar mustache twirling it and laughing maniacally yes. in the background. I think it's people honestly <laughs> trying to get good information out there, um, for the most part. Uh, but because we are all biased, and that's why we have to be conscious consumers of the literature. You don't think what? there's some villain out there saying, "Yeah, <laughs> just wait till this research comes wait out." Wait till my chicken plant research comes out. They're, it's red, they're the ones that are saying, "I'm putting this research together to prove yes. my technique works." But but that's done out of um, uh, let's let's call it passion. Yes, it's just it's so it's just like it's like a next level of argument because like yeah like, oh trigger points don't exist and then i feel like someone if i were arguing with them someone could be like google real quick and be like yeah you know yeah, yeah right they do. right and then you say so so let's pull that up oh wait it, it's not a peer-reviewed journal um <laughs> you own the you own the journal that happens <laughs> um you own the, the journal, <laughs> you, you <laughs> <is> your journal. <laughs> i'm gonna do a study to prove what i do works and i'm gonna make a journal to publish it in um the oh so, so there need really, truly, there needs to be some, or, some thought behind what we believe and, and a little bit of skepticism, but kind skepticism, if that's a thing. Yeah. And I, re- I heard in the most recent podcast you guys released that you participated in a course where you, or did you teach it or participate where they talked it? You guys talked about how to break that down real quick. Oh, no, we did. That's Neil, Neil O'Connell and Steve Camper. We had them come to a class <laughs> because, because, because it's hard. Um, yeah. and, and it's really hard to be good at it, and but it's really I think necessary to be good at it because I want the stuff I do to work. Yeah, I want I want manual therapy to help people, and I want it to be efficient and fast. Which means I need to read manual therapy literature very critically because I know my bias. So I'm going to have to take a harder look at those than stuff that I'm a little more neutral on. Um, because I'm I am a human and unlikely to see the things I don't want to see. So you got to look extra hard for them. Um, Sorry. And why, so why does it matter? And I have a patient coming in exactly three minutes. So why does it matter is that um, because of that person coming in three minutes, uh, they're, <laughs> they're paying, no, they're, they're paying money to see me, whether it's to an insurance company or me directly, they're still paying money. Um, they got better things to do than come here. And it's on me to be as efficient and as effective as I can be to make them not need me. It really is a weird profession. Um, but uh, but so, so I, I need to be a, as smart as I can be to, to be as good of a steward with their time and money as I can. Mm-hmm. And I, I take that kind of seriously because I do think it's an honor to be in healthcare and um, people trust me with parts of themselves they, they might not even have known they had before they had a problem. <laughs> yeah, pretty serious. Yeah, it is really, and and man, when you can when you can do it, uh, when you do it well, and you're you're, I don't give many people my cell phone, um, but some people just really, really are scared. And um, I, I was out a couple of years ago at dinner with someone, and and got this text that said, "Had sex, it was awesome." And I'm looking at the phone, going, "Please be a patient. Please be a patient. <laughs> Please." So I kind of thought of who I might, and then I went to go on the EMR, and I'm looking, and I'm like, hey, good. congratulations. <laughs> yeah, good. Wait on your response. Like, I'm not responding till tomorrow. <laughs> that is awesome. Don't send pictures. Yeah, I mean, uh-huh. it's, it's um, but but very, very cool. It's a huge part of a person's life, and we, we want to help them get better. That's, like, that's, how many she's people? Got to, she's got to go. Oh, sorry. She's got to oh, go. Oh, yeah, one, one last question. <laughs> I want to ask about trigger points real quick. Okay. Go. Are they a thing? Um, the phenomenon of a thing has been shown, but whether it's any more 
uh, relevant to what's going on in a person's lived pain experience than a bulge of a disc is never been proven. So you'd say it is more dermatome based? Um, I think pain's fairly complex. Um, a stiff spot might be relevant or it might not be. By the pure definition of trigger point, if I put pressure into it and it creates the um, uh, problem, like recreates the problem, I'm going to run up to my phone and try and let this person in. So you don't hear the phone in. So popular. Um, no, it's my person. We have a, it's Chicago. We have a closed front door, so you have to buzz in. Mm, very um, cool. The, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Trigger points. Do they exist? Um, Dermatome. Dermatomes. Oh, no. A stiff spot will make you not move very well. Um, unstiffening the spot will move better. I think that's probably as much important as they have. Um, there's probably a lot of different ways to get it unstiff. And you probably don't need seven levels of something to do it. But um, that's just my thought. I could be wrong. And I, so I tell everyone, I, I could be wrong. If, I, if trigger points are faster than one or needling and injecting trigger points is faster than what I currently do, then I will be a late doctor. And, and I'll take, some, <laughs> take a class. No, I'll take some classes. <laughs> I'll take some classes and learn the skill. But at the moment, I don't feel the need to. That's awesome. And even the referred pain from a trigger point. Sorry, last question. Yeah. No, that's cool. I mean, because, because it's what the person tells you it is. I just believe them. Okay. Um, cool. All right. This was fun, guys. Thanks for having me on. We Thank went you. from, like, all over the place. I, uh, let me know on social media how your exercises go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll send you a text. And make a video. Send me yeah. a text. Don't make a video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sandy. Okay. Bye, guys. Want to thank everybody for listening. We always appreciate all the reviews you guys give us, whether it be positive or negative. Don't forget to leave a review either through Facebook, where we're most active, or iTunes. So subscribe to it if you'd want to. And also, if you're uh, if you're on Facebook, check out our new group, the Duck Legs Podcast After Show Party. You can search for that group on Facebook, or it's linked to our page. Basically, we're gonna try to have some of you the listeners try to get on our show we'll, we'll host you on the show you can you can uh, serve as a co-host or guest if you want we'll try to uh, make this some kind of networking opportunity and give more people a voice especially give more students a voice and possibly hook up some students with some guests that they'd like to interview maybe in their uh, niche or field that they'd like to learn more about so feel free to join that. And also don't forget, you can go to ducklegs.weebly.com to check out our website. We're slowly building that up. Once you're there, we also have resources, including Danny Matei's awesome Gym PT Blueprint course that you can check out. Full disclosure, we do get a kickback on that if you were to purchase. So if you're interested in that course and want to support the Duck Legs, feel free to use our affiliate link. And it, I took it, the course, and it's a badass course. And also on our website, if you're an Amazon shopper, you can also use our links, our Amazon affiliate links, to make purchases through Amazon, and we get a small percentage of anything you buy on Amazon as well. For Tyler and I and Dimir, uh, kind of the founders of this whole podcast, if you want to say the word founders, we greatly appreciate anybody that takes the time out of their day to even listen to 30 seconds of us say words in microphones and trying to make each other laugh. So greatly appreciate you. Thank you.